Hi, it's Random Math Sync. It has been a while, but today we're going to be talking about how to calculate the values of pi using some probability and a toothpick. Let's say you have a piece of paper and you draw lines on it and you divide them into little strips. Now I take that piece of paper and I have a toothpick and I drop that toothpick onto the paper. What's the chance, what's the probability of the toothpick actually landing on one of these lines? And this is an actual mathematical problem called Buffon's Needle Problem, named after this Italian mathematician with a really long name. I think that's the picture of the wrong Buffon. That's better. Now this problem involves basic probability, which means it shouldn't be too hard, because we know that the probability of an event will equal to the number of favourable outcomes divided by the number of total outcomes that could happen from the event. And so therefore, it shouldn't be too hard for us to work out the probability of whatever event we're trying to find. Except it is a bit trickier than it actually sounds. If we were to find a probability in a dice roll, that is much easier because there is six outcomes and all the outcomes are discrete. They are all separate of each other. There's no in between. You can't roll a 1.5. You can only roll a 1 or you can roll a 2. But in our case, when we throw a toothpick and we have it drop on a piece of paper, the outcomes is not discrete because the toothpick could actually be anywhere on a piece of paper. And not just that, the toothpick can rotate and be at any orientation as well when it lands on the piece of paper. And so basically there is practically an infinite number of outcomes that we can get when we toss a toothpick and make it land on a piece of paper. And so basic probability is not so basic anymore for our example. We need to find a slightly different approach. So now let's dive right into the problem and try to figure it out. Now in this problem there are two things that we could actually change. We could change the size of the stick and we could change how far the line is apart from each other. So I'm going to assign variables to these two factors. I'll call the length of the stick or the toothpick as s and I'll call the distance between the two parallel lines L. So now we have two variables s and l which could change and will affect the probability of the stick landing on the line. Now there are two possible cases. We can either have a stick which is longer than the distance between the two lines or we have an s which is bigger than l or we can have a stick which is equal to or less than that of the distance between the two lines, or we have L bigger than S. Now the first case is a bit harder than the second one, so for the purpose of this video I will mainly be talking about the second case, where the stick is shorter than the spacing between the lines, although I'll leave a link in the description to Wikipedia in case anyone wants to see the solution for the first case. Now when we toss the stick into the air, the stick needs to land somewhere and it needs to be rotated and oriented in some certain angle. So let's try to make some of these information actual variables so it's much easier to work with. And so let's say you throw the stick and it lands somewhere along that line. Now for our case, since the stick is no longer than the spacing between the lines, the stick will either only overlap one of the line or overlap none of the lines. There's no way that the stick can land in such a way that it covers up two lines, unless we're talking about the first case, which we're not. And so for this explanation, I'm only going to consider the stick with respect to a single line out of all of those infinite number of parallel lines. When this line that we consider will be the line that the, either the stick lands on or is the line that the stick is closest to. Now the stick will have two ends. One end will be on the left and the other one will be on the right. I'm going to call the distance from the right end of the stick to the line and I'm going to define this as x. Now I'll also give x a range. The smallest value that x can be will be zero, which means that the right end of the stick is where the line that we're interested in is. And we'll make the biggest value of x equal to l, which is when the right end of the stick is right where the next line 
is. Because we don't need to consider x anywhere beyond l, because after that, the probabilities will just be the same again anyway. Now that's where it lands horizontally. What about vertically? Well, we don't actually need to consider where the stick lands vertically, because it doesn't matter if the stick lands here or the stick lands here. It's practically the same, because the line doesn't change going up vertically. So we don't need to care where the stick lands up here or all the way down here. So now what about the orientation of the stick? Well, the stick could be lying like this, or it could be at an angle like this. I'll define this angle theta. Now, what's the range of theta? What could the angle of theta be? Well, it's very simple. If the stick's perpendicular to the lines, then theta will equal to zero. But if the stick is parallel to the lines, then theta will equal to 90 degrees or pi over two radians. So theta could range anywhere from zero degrees to 90 degrees or zero degrees to pi over two radians. So that was way too long just talking about the variables. Now let's actually go into the probabilities. And so let's say we have a stick with a constant value of theta with a certain orientation. Now the value for x of the stick could be anywhere from zero all the way to L, as I've mentioned earlier. Now I can translate the stick from zero to L, keeping its rotation the same. But how far could I move the stick so that the stick still actually lands on the line? Well, I can move the stick from x equals to zero to this distance. But how far have I moved the stick? Well, I know that the length of the stick is s, and I know that its orientation is theta. And so how far I've moved the stick is just this length, which equals to s times cosine of theta. And so we have the stick fixed at this orientation. The probability of the stick actually landing on the line will equal to s times cosine theta divided by l. But this is the value for just one theta. We have an infinite number of values of theta that it could be at, all ranging from 0 to 2 pi radians. So I can plot a graph looking a bit like this, where this bit down here is the graph of s cosine theta, which represents all of the orientation which the stick lands on the line. And this outer rectangle here represents all of the cases that could happen, all the values of x and all the values of theta. And so to find the probability, we have to divide the total number of successful outcomes divided by the numbers of total outcomes, which means we have to divide the area of the graph here by the area of the graph here. But how can we find the areas under these two graphs? <gasps> oh my god. God. And so we have to use a bit of calculus, more specifically integration. The probability of the stick landing on the line will equal to the number of favorable outcomes divided by the number of total outcomes. The number of favorable outcomes is represented by the area under the graph x equals s cosine theta. And the number of total outcomes is represented by the area under the line x equals l. And so in order to find the area under these two curves, we have to integrate both of these curves with respect to theta. And we're going to do this over the range from 0 to pi over 2 radians. And so standard integration. L and s are both constants, so I'm going to take them out. The integral of cosine theta is just sine theta, and the integral of 1 is just going to be theta. And then obviously we just plug the values of pi over 2 and 0 in like this, like you'd normally do an in integration. Then you spit out an answer looking like this. And so there we get the answer. The answer of the probability of the stick landing on the line equals to 2s over pi l, which is brilliant. There it is, that's the answer to Buffon's needle problem. But we're not quite done there, because there's one bit that's really interesting that we should consider. Now I can find the probability of this problem experimentally by actually tossing the stick and seeing how many times it lands. And I know the length l, and I know the length s. And so I rearrange the equation like this, I can find a pi. I can actually find what pi is if I know these three variables. Hmm. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to try to find pi 
experimentally using probability and a toothpick. So I'm going to take a toothpick and I'm going to take a piece of paper and I'm going to draw a whole bunch of lines on that piece of paper. To make things simple, I'm going to make sure that the distance between the lines and the length of the stick are both the same, so L equals to S, and so our probability becomes 2 pi, which is much simpler to work with. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a piece of paper and a toothpick. And I'm going to throw the toothpick onto the piece of paper a hundred times and record all the successful attempts, how many times the stick actually lands on the piece of paper. So then I tossed the stick a hundred times and I got 68 successful outcomes. You can actually check out the whole video there. And so P equals to 0 0.68 and that's from doing the experiment. And so now I can rearrange the equation so that we have pi as a subject and we get pi to roughly equal to 2 divided by 0 0.68, which if I actually plug it in on my calculator, gets a value of 2.9412, which is, you know, quite far away from what pi actually is. Like, 2.9 like seriously that that's nowhere near pi come on but you know it's all me it's it's my throwing that's at fault i don't throw the stick high enough sometimes um sometimes the stick might just land and not really be truly random and because i'm human and i get tired i was throwing the stick at 11 for god's sake and so it was at that point i decided that i needed to use something much more sophisticated I turned to a computer to one of the most beautiful coding software out there in the market, Microsoft Excel. So here's what I did. I got Microsoft Excel to simulate two different numbers, the value of X and the value of theta. And then I got Microsoft Excel to find out another number, which equals to X minus S cosine theta. Now, if the stick does cross the line, you can see that the new length that we've found will be a negative value. And if it doesn't cross the line, this length will be a positive value. And so basically, I just had to run an if statement that if this new value is less than zero, then we get a successful outcome. And so that's it. It's very simple. It's done on Excel, but it's more random than what I did from earlier when I was actually tossing the stick. There is less factor that's going to create a bias for it. And rather than doing it a hundred times, I did it 10,000 times. Yes, I did it 10,000 times, so it is very simple. I just had to drag all the formulas down all the way to 10,000 rows. And then it was very simple. We just had to count the number of successes and divide that by 10,000 to get the experimental probability. And this is going to be so much more accurate than what I did because in one, it's more random and two, we get more samples of it. And so by taking our experimental probability and shoving it into this equation and trying to get a value of pi, we get out a value of pi, which is equal to 3.15 something. And to be honest, that is much better than what we got from earlier, 2.9 something. Come on. But yes, this is it for my Pi Day video this year on how to calculate Pi experimentally. Thank you very much for watching this video today and I'll see you again very soon. But until then, I'm going to go off and eat a pie. Is this a pie or is this a pasty? Eh, whatever. <laughs> Look how sad I am. I'm, I'm filming myself eating a pie on camera and I'm going to upload it on YouTube. Come on, like...